Our world is lost in unnecessary fear and hurt. Our systems seem scientifically engineered to make you small, powerless, and always waiting for the next great leader who will fix the problems around us. Of course, we're witnessing neighbor versus neighbor while warfare breaks out around our family tables. But you have access to a spirit, a strength that enlarges and empowers you. Even better, you don't need to wait for the next big movement. You can heal the world. It's time for governance by Grace. Welcome to Grace Archie with Jim Babka. So we want to air this interview that Jim and Perry Willis did on immigration because it's foundational to the conversation here. And it's pre-recorded. It's all good. We're going to give yeah. you about 19, 20 minutes worth and uh, then come back. We'll tag it at the end. But Jim, why don't you set this up so the audience knows what's happening here? I used to have another podcast. I only did a handful of episodes. This was the final one. Uh, Perry Willis and I worked together at Downsize DC and before that in other ventures. So we've got a long standing relationships and we did this in 2018. This was the summer of 2018. So if it feels a little bit dated for that, uh, that would be the reason. Uh, the idea was to put all of the main arguments uh, for the pro-immigration position, uh, what some people even uh, pejoratively call the open borders position, uh, out on the table and and you know do it in, in a quick time. Uh, so we did that. And I'm actually pretty pleased with the effort that we put out, so much so that I want to share it with everybody here again today as part of the There's series that we've been stuff. having on immigration. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. I, I love the financial um, impact that Perry talks about, but I don't want to spoil it. No spoiler alerts here. So let's let people listen to it and then we'll come back and talk to you at the end. I wanted to ha take a moment to talk about the issue of immigration because I think it's such a very, very vital, important issue that libertarians in particular need to understand. And I've welcomed in somebody that I really respect uh, on this issue, somebody who really seems to grasp the, the deep interworkings and importance of this issue, and that's Perry Willis. I speak to him virtually every day. We work together at Downsize DC. We co-created the Zero Aggression Project, um, known him for more than 20 years now, and we've uh, he was before that the national director of the Libertarian Party. So he's been in the movement for quite a while and has been able to see a number of things and trends that have occurred. And we'll touch on why that's important before we finish here at the very end. But I want to talk about immigration kind of at, at, on all levels. Uh, let's see if we can hit that with Perry Willis. Perry, welcome to the show. Hi, Jim. Perry, tell us why you see the immigration issue as being such a big issue. Well, it hits on uh, it hits on just about everything. I think the you know, immigration controls are wrong in every possible way. They're wrong morally. They're wrong legally. They're wrong practically. They're wrong economically. They're wrong wrong strategically, and they're also wrong historically. I can't think of a single good argument for immigration controls, and yet people are going crazy over this issue, thinking, gosh, we've got to do something about it. Well, no, you don't, because doing something about it would be wrong in every possible way. The wall builders, uh, who I would call know-nothing nativists in many cases, um, think when they're coming to us that they're presenting some original set of arguments, that the things that, they've say, that they're saying we've never, ever heard before. And Perry, I'd like to take that list you just gave. I believe you said morally, legally, practically, economically, strategically, and historically. I'd like to go through those if we could maybe here one by one and, and, and really you know, burrow down in this because it does turn out there's not really any good answer. So let's start with the moral question. What are, what's the moral issue at stake on, the, on immigration? Well, we see the moral issue right at the beginning of the country in the Declaration of Independence. The, the Declaration of Independence established the moral framework for the government that would follow, at least it tried to. And one of the concepts in there is the concept of inalienable rights, that we all have rights that are ours by nature, by the fact that we're human. In other words, they don't come from government. Our rights don't come from government. They precede government. They precede the, con the Constitution. So if that's true, then... It's also the case that uh, not only do Americans have these rights, but Mexicans and uh, people from the Middle East have these rights too. So one of those rights is the right to associate with other people. Uh, when we have immigration controls, we impinge on the right of Americans to associate with people from foreign countries. Another right is the presumption of innocence. When we say that you cannot uh, move about freely, 
uh, because some people in your category, be it Mexican or Islam or whatever, are criminals, we've thrown out the presumption of innocence. Uh, I think one of the ways to illustrate all this is if two people have property side by side on the Mexico border, and one of them wants to have Mexicans come across the line to, onto their property, and the other one doesn't, both are within their rights. But if the state steps in and says, no, you can't have Mexicans on your property, or yes, you must have Mexicans on your property, then our association rights and our property rights have been violated. And so these are moral violations that go against the very heart of the principle that the country was supposedly founded on. So, you know, you're going back to our founding and you're talking about these rights. You and I prefer to refer to these as pre-constitutional rights, right? And some right. of our audience might even say those rights come from God himself, right? They came as a part of who we are uh, as, a, as a creation. But if you, uh, you're starting to get into kind of a legal matter as well, and, and people tend to forget the Constitution actually is the highest law of the land. What are the legal arguments now against the anti-immigrant position? Well, the, uh, any kind of immigration control law at all, well, legislation would be actually a better word for it, any kind of immigration control legislation at all violates the Constitution in several ways. It violates the First Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, the Ninth Amendment, and the Tenth Amendment. So the First Amendment is about uh, free association. Uh, I, if I want to associate with a Mexican, I should be able to. Uh, the Sixth Amendment is about the presumption of innocence. Uh, just because you think some Mexicans may turn out to be criminals doesn't mean that you can uh, prohibit the free movement of Mexicans who aren't criminals. The Ninth Amendment is about protecting a general uh, uh, bias on a part of the government in favor of freedom. So you just, you know, unless you're hurting someone, you're, unless you're aggressing against someone or defrauding someone, the government has no role. In the matter, you can't you can't legislate on something unless it has to do with aggression or fraud. And finally, is the Tenth Amendment, which limits the federal government to just those uh, functions that are explicitly described and enumerated in the Constitution. And in fact, there is no uh, enumerated power to control immigration. There is an enumerated power to control naturalization, who gets to vote, but no power at all to control immigration. Let's just and take a moment. Let's just make take a moment, Perry, to focus in on that. What is the difference between immigration and naturalization? Yeah, this is the one of the crucial things that the distinctions that people have to understand in order to think coherently about this issue. Naturalization is who gets to be a citizen and who gets to vote. Immigration is who gets to to visit the country, either to live here as a resident alien or as a tourist. Those are two totally separate things. So the Constitution permits Congress to write legislation about naturalization, who gets to be a citizen and who gets to vote. And in, and in fact, one of the first laws ever passed by Congress was a naturalization law. But no immigration laws were even attempted by Congress for the first 100, 100 years of the republic because they knew they didn't have an enumerated power to legislate about immigration. Okay, but there's this issue of sovereignty, right? And and here we start to get into whether or not, you know, the nation has a, a power. We're always told this is the response. After we tell everybody it's not constitutional, they pretend that there's some kind of law of nations that, that supersedes uh, the Constitution and that uh, the border has to somehow or other be protected. What is – how much does the border actually need to be protected, Perry? The border is just about jurisdiction. It's on this side, this set of laws holds – sway. And on the other side of the border, another set of laws hold sway. Or if you wanted to be really cynical about it, you could say a border defines, you know, which gangsters control the populace on each side of the line. Uh, in terms of sovereignty, sovereignty belongs to the individual. Uh, the government, you know, again, we go back to the Declaration of Independence again. Where does government get its power? It gets its power delegated from the citizens. The citizens are sovereign. So what do you do in a case when citizens disagree about something? Well, like, let's go back to the case of the two guys on the border who own property side by side. They, they disagree about whether or not they want Mexicans in the country. Well, they can each make that decision for themselves on their own property, but not on the property of the other, because that would be a violation of each other's sovereignty. 
So and it's this, individual sovereignty that matters. This starts to get into why immigration control isn't practical. Uh, explain to, uh, to our audience what the practicality aspect of this issue is. There, essentially, it's another form of prohibition. So we all know about alcohol prohibition. We've come to learn about drug prohibition. We know about gun prohibition. And it's interesting, a lot of people that are anti-immigration are also pro-gun ownership. And they can well understand that if you pass a gun prohibition law, only the good people are going to be affected by it. The criminals are not going to be affected by it. Well, the same thing happens with people prohibition and, and this, this idea about vetting. If you try and vet at the border to only let the good people in and keep the bad people out, well, what's going to happen? The good people are going to go along with the vetting. And the bad people are going to bypass it, just like with guns and drugs and alcohol. Are you trying so, to say that, gov- that a government program doesn't necessarily work? Yeah, yeah most of them <laughs> most of them obviously don't work. Absolutely. Well, to what do you attribute the magical thinking that suddenly occurs that we can put up a wall on the border then or that we can vet people at the, uh, at the border? I mean, we did with Ellis Island, didn't we? We did manage to successfully vet people there. Well, a lot of people think that. I think Ellis Island was vetting theater. In other words, it was uh, fiction. It was it was uh, let's play pretend. Like because the TSA, they, like the TSA does for airplanes now. That's right, which is security theater. Uh, so what do they do at Ellis Island? People come up, they ask them some questions, and they and the and the person asking the questions makes a ruling on whether or not the person can enter based on the way the person responds to the questions. Well, that just basically ends up coming down to individual intuition and prejudice. It's not really vetting. Uh, It it wasn't the Internet age. They couldn't look stuff up on a line to see to learn about this person. Uh, And when it comes to, you know, now we are in the Internet age. So you would think, well, now we can do the vetting and it would actually work. Well, where are you going to get the information? Somebody's coming from uh, Iraq uh, or Syria. So let's use Syria. You, you, where are you going to get the information about the person who's coming from Syria? Is Assad's government going to tell you? Well, they're going to have a, an invested interest to tell you false things. So there's really no way to do vetting. And if there was a good way to do vetting, then the bad people would just bypass it. They just go around it, just like they'll go around your wall. Uh, if you build a wall, they're either going to climb over it with larger ladders, or they're going to tunnel under it, or they're going to bribe the guards on the other side, or they're going to get visit on a visa, and they won't go back home, so or they're going to land on the beach. We're starting to actually, you know, even as we're having this discussion, it's amazing how many of these aspects overlap each other. We're starting to get into an economic discussion, too, because these costs of these programs is really, really high. I mean, to build this wall all the way from from California to the other side of Texas, I mean, this, you know, you're talking, I mean, this is like a almost two-day drive. I mean, I don't know how many trips to Home Depot someone's going to have to make to put this wall together, but it's it's hard to even imagine they're going to be able to do it. And, you know, the thing is that there's an overlap. You talked about the overlap in the previous segment between those people who understand prohibition doesn't work when it comes to guns, but don't seem to see the same problems that you just laid out when it comes to people, people prohibition. We also notice that many of these people claim to be conservative and they maybe embrace capitalism or free market economics in some way. What is the economic impact of turning away people from other countries? Well, it's like it's like saying I want the products I buy to be more expensive. And the reason people don't understand this is because they don't understand that someone that is a producer is also a consumer. So let's say uh, somebody comes over from Mexico and they're going to do a job. And they're going to do that job more cheaply than you would do it. And so you think, oh, well, that's hurting my wages, so that's their, that, that's hurting me economically. But the reality of it is that the person who's doing the job cheaper is making it possible for products to be cheaper so that your cost of living goes down. Meanwhile, you uh, get to go uh, to do a different job uh, where you have a comparative advantage over the Mexican and can earn a higher wage. Not only that, the Mexican who came in and is doing a a cheap job for you now also has to buy stuff to eat. He has to buy a place to live. He has to buy transportation. And so he becomes a customer. 
And so the, 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 what, what you're doing by not letting him come across the border to work and contribute wealth creation to your society is you're making yourself poor. You're making your own cost of living go up. But don't, uh, don't immigrants steal jobs? Uh, they, they may take individual jobs just as some other American who has a better skill set for a particular job than you do might take an, indi uh, an individual job from you. But overall, they create jobs because they are making it possible because they're, consu they're, they're, they're consumers themselves. The, the Mexican who's working at a job has to buy stuff, right? They're a consumer. So they create jobs by virtue of the fact that they're consumers. Uh, there's been uh, studies that have been done of this, and one of the estimates is, this was published in Forbes magazine, that if you dropped all immigration restrictions around the world, the result would be an increase in uh, worldwide wealth in excess of $70 trillion. It's basically double the current uh, size of all economies combined. Yeah, so ask yourself, do you want to be twice as rich as, rich as you are now? Or, or think of it another way. Do you want your cost of living to drop in half? Would you like to have a 20-hour work week instead of a 40-hour work week? Well, that's what would be possible if we had free human movement around the globe. We could probably have a, tr a same standard of living now we have now and have a 20-hour work week. All right. So there's still one concern. And, and I, you know, I'm actually going to give people a little bit of the benefit of the doubt here. Maybe I shouldn't. That they're concerned that a wave of immigration is going to come in and they're going to vote a bunch of Nancy Pelosi's into office. What's, what are the strategic implications here? I mean, literally, I mean, what, is this a reasonable fear and how can we prevent it? Absolutely. Uh, there are two reasonable fears. One is the people are going to come in and vote the wrong way. Uh, and vote uh, a government that will destroy our freedoms. Uh, another concern is that they'll come in and they'll get lots of tax-funded benefits. I think those are both legitimate concerns. But if you want to fix those concerns, the way you do it is you don't do this vetting theater and you don't try to build a wall because those things aren't going to work. All those things are going to do is curtail American freedom and they're not going to actually solve the problem. Meanwhile, the Constitution has given you the means to actually solve this problem in an effective way. Here's what you do. You control naturalization, which is what you're supposed to do. You, you, can, you can tailor the naturalization laws to whatever you want them to be in order to protect yourself from this. You can make it so that the first generation doesn't get to vote if you want. You could make them wait 20 years before they get to vote if, if that's what you think should be done. But that's, that's something you can do constitutionally. What you can't do constitutionally is control human movement. It sounds to me like you just described amnesty. Well, I, if, it depends on whether or not we care about the law. The law says you cannot have any immigration controls whatsoever. So if that's the case, then there is no such thing as an illegal alien. So there is no such thing as amnesty. Because the law itself, the, the so-called law that can try, try to control the immigration is itself illegal. Okay, so, so I just want to be clear. If after you've heard some – after you've explained this to somebody, they go, oh, that sounds like amnesty, and they're, they're resistant to that. They just simply don't want those people here. What do you conclude? I think that the words bigotry and racism are way overused. But if I tell someone your, nat, your, nat, your, uh, your voting concern is legitimate, your tax-funded benefits concern is legitimate, but the way to handle that is by changing the laws based on those things and not by trying to have an unconstitutional immigration law. And they still double down on wanting to have the immigration laws and they still double down on the wall. I can only conclude that they are, in fact, a bigot, that their motivations are something else other than what they say. Perry, you've, you've given us a moral argument, a legal argument, a practical argument, an economic argument, a strategic argument, five different arguments. And I, there were six items that you had on the list. And so the last one, I'm just going to throw up a big softball. I want you to make America great again. Let's make America great. What is the historical case for immigration? Well, the period that we became great in was from 1776 forward to the 20th century. When we look at that period... For the first 100 years of the republic, during this whole period when we were becoming the greatest nation on earth, we had completely open borders. 
open borders, completely open borders. Is that and a coincidence? We've thrived. I don't think a- it's a coincidence at all. It's because when you allow freedom, the original American idea, going back to the Declaration of Independence, prosperity happens. That's why America became great, because we had freedom. Well, there were some notable bad exceptions like slavery, but overall, we were one of the freest countries on earth. And part of that freedom was freedom of human movement. People could move around and associate with each other and make deals and cooperate. And the result was fabulous wealth. This happened when we had open borders. Perry, we every time we take on this issue, every time we take on this issue, we get we get heat, we get flack. Um, we lose subscribers along the years. We've lost donors. Um, there's a reason that we keep returning to this, aside from the fact that maybe we're a little bit crazy. Uh, it's not exactly the best business model, but but there's there's a bigger goal. There's something that we're after. There's a reason that we keep repeating this theme. What what is that? Back when I started libertarian work in 1980. Uh, Everyone, and I mean everyone, disagreed with us about the drug issue. And everyone suggested, you know, you'll, you'll really get a lot further and you'll do a lot better if you'll just stop talking about this drug issue. But we didn't do that. We kept talking about it relentlessly. And what happened? Society moved in our direction to the point now where we're probably going to have legalized marijuana nationwide very soon. And given what the examples we've seen with places like Portugal, we're probably going to have uh, completely legalized drugs of all forms not too long after that. Well, I think we're in the same situation now with the immigration issue that we were with the drug issue back in 1980. We need to keep talking about this argument, this issue relentlessly, because when people understand this, when they come to grasp how important freedom of human movement is, then we will be accelerating toward a libertarian society at a very rapid rate. And I think this is the crucial issue, one of the crucial issues, there's probably two or three others too, to make that happen. When people understand that borders are just about jurisdiction, they're not property boundaries, they're not anything else, they're just about jurisdiction and people should be able to move freely across them. When people understand that, we're well on our way to a libertarian society. Immigration is free. Naturalization, let's talk about that. Thank you for being with us, Perry. My pleasure. Thanks, Jim. Good luck for the rest of the show. Can you imagine open borders and the worldwide GDP that would happen as a result and the wealth that would accrue to everybody and the ease of life and all the other things? There's a basis for this, right? We have we have facts for this. Yeah. And so you've heard here now, Perry and I making this case, but if you recall a couple episodes ago, we also talked about what Governor Abbott's been doing to his country or his state, I should say, um, and, and, and what he's doing to his, not just his state in terms of economically, but also politically. But we talked about per capita income and GDP. We talked about the effect of, t- of innovation that comes with all the new faces and voices that are entering uh, our economic stream, why we all benefit. It lifts, it's a, it's, it's a tide. Immigration is a tide that lifts all, all boats. And it's evidence that we won the contest. Yeah, that we made America great again, which we've done already, yeah. by the way, with open borders. Just well, I would like reminder. to see, I would like to see true free. I mean, that's what we talked about is true freedom of movement. Yes. And constitutionally speaking, that's exactly what's supposed to happen. I think the argument that we make that is the most unique in this episode is the distinction between naturalization and immigration. Yeah, thank you for that, because it cleared me up a whole lot. Having lived in Southern California most of my life, we get a lot of immigration here. I was uh, raised in a conservative household. My father was a Goldwater uh, Republican, a uh, big Reagan fan. That was how I was raised. And I start off, uh, you know, as a, in my reckless youth, I was a, a college Republican. And uh, I believe that the Constitution was a sacred document and that what it wrote, what the men in, wrote there, the founding fathers, what they wrote what they meant and they meant what they said. And the 10th Amendment said that if something wasn't expressed in there, if the word doesn't appear 
If a power isn't granted, it belongs to the states or the people respectively. There is zero power on immigration in there. That's the 10th Amendment. So if you want to say that, hey, we believe that the federal government shouldn't be sticking its nose in this or that or the other, the Constitution given, did not give them the power to do so. Same thing's true of immigration. It's not in there for the reasons that we discussed in there. What we're talking about is what are the rules for naturalization going to be? And I personally am very open to a conversation about that, but I really would like to recognize the innate value. This is something we're very, very keen on here at Grace Arkey. Every person made in the image of God, every person matters to God. If God matters to you, then those people should matter to you. Now we have some constitutional proof to back that up. Just want to say thank you to you and to Perry Willis for for putting this information out there in the great metaverse of all the information that exists and for bringing it back here as a part of Grace Arkey so we can let our audience know that yes, there's a really, really good case to be made here. And we want to help you, every the, one of you listening and watching to make it. The intention of this series, particularly this episode, has been, and the one previous where we went through the Bible, uh, the Bible verses about this, is to create permanent things that can be shared with family and friends. So I want to encourage people to take these gifts as you just described them and share them, make them gifts to other people, help them get this information and use them to start discussions. There's a power that comes from listening outside of conversation where someone's active mind is turned off. They're not thinking of the next brilliant thing they have to say in an argument. They're actually receiving and taking in that information. So this could be a very effective tool for you uh, to help share uh, these truths. Thank you.